So uh, just to give you a little overview about what I hope to cover tonight and, and certainly want to answer your questions as we go through this and as we, we wrap up at the end. But we'll really talk about um, how the principles of managed grazing apply to targeted grazing and, and define targeted grazing. We'll talk a little bit about the importance of, of setting and communicating goals. Um, one of the, the things that, that we find in targeted grazing is that we have this relationship between folks who want vegetation managed, but maybe don't have much of an idea about what livestock can do with folks that have a, a good understanding of the livestock end of things. We'll talk about some of the practical considerations in managing livestock for multiple um, purposes. Uh, talk a little bit about grazing behavior. And then I think one of the questions that, that I get asked a lot, both by producers and by, by folks looking to, to get property grazed is, why should we pay for this? You're just feeding your livestock. And we'll spend a little time talking about the trade-offs involved in all of this. I've got some before and after photos of our, um, our sheep grazing on annual rangeland. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. And then for those of you that are interested in this as a business, we'll, we'll conclude with talking a little bit about the importance of balance and, and understanding what your primary business might be. One of my favorite authors is a, a guy named Ivan Doig, who was a Montana author um, who grew up with sheep. If you have a chance to read any of his novels, I highly recommend them. But one of his best novels is about um, Scottish immigrants coming to Montana and raising sheep. And I think, uh, at least in my experience in raising sheep, this quote um, pretty much nails it. And the same applies to targeted grazing. Um, if you're in the targeted grazing business and you've got animals um, you know, out in a neighborhood grazing along open space adjacent to homes, you'll be sleeping with your cell phone by your bedside. Um, it, it really is kind of an all-consuming business in terms of, of making this work. To give you a little bit of my background, um, I ran my own targeted grazing business for about six years using both sheep and goats and, and during the course of that business also contracted to manage a large-scale operation here in Placer County, um, upwards of 3,000 head of sheep and goats. So I've got some direct experience in, in kind of the logistical challenges and, and really seeing firsthand and what sheep and goats can do. We currently have a small scale commercial sheep business. And while we don't charge for grazing, we trade winter grass for summer fuel load reduction here close to Auburn. Um, and then my day job, of course, is, is working with UC Cooperative Extension. So I wanna start with some of the principles of managed grazing. And, and these are really from um, a course that we have taught now, uh, my predecessor taught and, and I've taught now for almost 20 years working with livestock producers. But these are really kind of the principles that we talk about with, with ranchers who are trying to um, improve their, their land management and their pasture or range management. So the first principle is that we wanna adjust the rest periods from grazing to match the growth rate of the plants that we're trying to impact. The second principle is that we want to use the shortest graze period possible while still maintaining that adequate rest. Um, and that, that's important for plant health and for root health in particular. We want to use the highest stock density possible. Um, so that's not necessarily the stocking rate, but the, the number of animals per unit of area. We'll talk about that. Then we want to use the largest herd size possible consistent with sound animal husbandry practices. And there are some animal and pasture management, range management principles that, that apply to this, but we'll talk about why this might be important in targeted grazing as well, some economic reasons. And then lastly, one of the things that we do in a ranch setting is try to adjust our stocking rate to the seasonal and annual changes in carrying capacity on the land we're managing. So certainly in, in our part of the world and here in the Sierra foothills, in March and April, we can graze a lot more animals than we can in September and October, simply because the grass is, is growing so rapidly. Now, if we translate this to targeted grazing, 
one of the first things we look at is using the shortest graze period possible. And I'll walk through why that is here in just a minute. We're not so concerned about adequate rest because in many cases we're trying to move on to the next project after we've grazed a particular um, piece of landscape. We also want to use the highest stock density possible. Um, and there's some reasons for that when we look at, at managing targeted vegetation. And then finally, we want to use that largest herd or flock size possible as well. What we're really looking at here is, is kind of understanding grazing behavior and animal impacts. So um, what are the, th this, is, this is where you can, can unmute yourself. What are the, the three impacts that grazing animals have on a plant or on vegetation? Any, any thoughts on that? There's one real obvious one that, that we're already, it's actually in the title to the slide. Yeah, we've got grazing, trampling, and uh, you're throwing me for a loop on number three here, Pat. <laughs> Good, well, we got the first one. So certainly we're gonna, we're gonna nice. consume that vegetation, right? Um, and that's one of the differences, particularly in a fuel load reduction setting that, that's different between grazing and say something like uh, mastication or, um, or herbicide treatment. In this case, we're converting that vegetation into, into muscle and fat and fiber and bone um, and actually removing it from the landscape. Trampling you mentioned is the second one and, and this is another important impact that we can use to our advantage. Um, trampling can help carbon cycle through the system by putting that plant material in contact with the soil and with soil microbes. Um, so that's another. And only a sheep range geek would go around taking pictures of sheep manure. Um, but that's another impact we can have. And we can use that to our advantage as well. We can, we can help cycle nutrients through these systems as well. And there's some, some advantages to that as, as we'll talk about here in a second. So in terms of that first principle, using the shortest graze period, uh, any of you that have livestock have probably noticed this, that when you turn animals into fresh pasture, they spend more time eating than they normally would. And part of the reason for that is that it's, it's novel um, forage for them. But another part of that is that they haven't yet made the other two impacts to that pasture or those plants yet. So they haven't trampled on it. And probably more importantly, they haven't defecated or urinated in that paddock, at least initially. And there's a kind of a, a grazing behavior term that actually applies, I think, to, uh, to human behavior too. Um, but when animals have done what they will do shortly after they've eaten something, when they've defecated and urinated in a pasture or a rangeland setting, that creates what's called a zone of repugnance, which I think is probably one of the best scientific terms I've ever heard. Uh, but if you'll notice when you're watching livestock graze, they won't graze immediately around those places where they've deposited manure or urine. And that's a health attribute that they've evolved over, over millennia, but it also is a tool that we can use um, in terms of managing that, that graze period. Voluntary forage intake or grazing is actually controlled by three factors. So how much time do the animals spend grazing? How often do they take a bite? And then how big a bite size can they take? The animals that we're talking about here, primarily sheep, goats, and cattle, all have very different grazing physiological responses in terms of how their mouths um, are able to utilize forage. Uh, sheep and goats are able to pick individual leaves off of plants, whereas cattle are more mass grazers um, and take a whole range of plants into their mouth at one time. Uh, but, but this is something that we could manage to our advantage in terms of, of uh, impacting vegetation in a targeted manner. Short graze periods also maintain that higher intake because they're always going into higher, into novel forage. And if you take a look at this graph over here, um, we maintain higher intake if we're constantly moving into new paddocks, into, into fresh feed. Um, and we can use that to our advantage, particularly as we're trying to do things like um, impact weeds or reduce fuel loading. The second principle that we talked about was a high stock density. 
Um, and these are our sheep that we grazed several years ago down in, in Rockland. But high stock density can help increase the consumption uniformity. Um, if you think about going to a buffet, if you're the only, if I, at least if I'm at a buffet and I'm the only person in line, um, I'm going to go take the stuff that I like and ignore the stuff that maybe I'm not sure about. But if it's, if the buffet is packed and there's people in line ahead of me and behind me and I don't know if I'm going to get a second serving, I'll take a little bit of everything because I want to try it before somebody else gets it. And the same principle really applies to grazing behavior. Um, if we have higher stock densities, those sheep or goats or cows are somewhat competitive in their grazing behavior and they will eat plants that maybe they wouldn't rank as, as their highest priority in terms of palatability when they're worried about their neighbor getting it first. Stock density can also help us, help us optimize the three impacts that we talked about. So if you were to look at this, um, at this rangeland setting where my sheep are grazing, um, after we moved them through there, a lot of that forage would be laid down on the ground. And there's some advantage to that as well, um, both in terms of carbon cycling, but even in terms of fuel load modification. Um, we haven't necessarily removed that fuel, but we've certainly put it down on the ground and reduced the amount of oxygen circulating around the fine fuel. Um, and so we're able to modify um, the, the fuel profile in that case. And then lastly, one of the things that can be really challenging in a targeted grazing setting is that we typically are trying to impact that vegetation at a time when it's declining in palatability and nutritional value. And so those higher stock densities can really help us utilize some of the lower quality vegetation more effectively. Any questions there? The last element is really looking at, at using the largest herd or flock size possible. Um, part of this is that we can again optimize those animal impacts that we've talked about um, under stock density. But from an economic standpoint, you know, there's, if you'll notice in this photograph, there's one person and one dog in that photograph. And there's actually around 600 head of goats um, in, that, in that particular photo. Um, that one person can manage 600 goats in just about the same amount of time that he could manage 50 goats. And so from an economic standpoint, the more rapidly we can move over a landscape, um, the, the more we can cut, generate revenue to cover that fixed amount of, of overhead. And uh, we'll talk more about that at the end of the month in the business workshop that we're going to do. But I think that's a really important factor to keep in mind that um, the largest herd size possible is, is important. So most of us have ha probably heard and, and maybe even used the term overgrazing, and I want to talk a little bit more about what that actually means because I think it does have some bearing when we're talking about targeted grazing or, or grazing for fuel load reduction. So our definition of overgrazing is really grazing a single plant before it has had a chance to recover from the previous grazing. So if we're grazing a plant during the growing season, those animals have, have defoliated it. In order for it to grow, it's going to have to draw energy out of its root system until it creates enough leaf area to photosynthesize again. And if we come back before it's able to, to create that, that new leaf area and graze it a second time, we can harm the root system. And that, that really is what overgrazing is. As such, it's a function of time, not of animal numbers. Um, and I think this is a really important factor to, to stress here. Probably most of us have driven by a pasture with a single horse in it and have seen that there's virtually no vegetation in that paddock. Um, so it's not a function of the fact that there's too many horses there. It's a function of that, the fact that the horse is there all the time and can graze the plants that it favors. Overgrazing can, can occur in two ways. Um, if we stay too long in a particular pasture and, and they take a second bite before the plant has recovered from the first bite, or we can come back too soon. So that rest period that we've referred to in the, in the grazing principles um, is too short. 
and we come back before the plants had a chance to recover. So that's all kind of a theoretical discussion to our purpose here tonight. Um, might there be a reason to overgraze in the context of targeted grazing? This, this photograph here, and I'll show you before and after here in a second. This photograph here was of a star thistle, thistle field um, in, I believe, late June. Um, and our, our goal here was to actually overgraze the star thistle, to hit it as it tried to recover a second time. And, and our purpose in doing that was to stress the plant enough that we'd reduce the seed production. I think the other question to think about, and we'll get into this in more depth, is, is that there may be some costs to overgrazing in a targeted grazing setting. Um, and we'll talk about that in terms of animal nutrition and, and animal well-being. All right, so overgrazing on purpose can put the livestock in some nutritional stress. And there is a cost to doing this. We'll talk about this in, in just a second. But what we may want to think about in terms of, of our purposes here in targeted grazing is that it's more important to get our timing right and to try to do, if, if our goal is to reduce fuel load or to control um, an invasive weed, perhaps focusing on a severe grazing um, more so than, than trying to get that second bite um, and overgrazing that plant. We'll, we'll talk about that in more depth. Just going to check in to see if there's any questions in the chat. It looks like we're good. So here's the, the before and after picture of that star thistle. Um, one of the things that we try to do in all of our grazing, whether it's targeted grazing or not, is really estimate how long we think we can stay in a particular pasture. There's a couple of reasons from a targeted grazing standpoint that this is important. Most jobs pay by the acre. There are still a few contracts out there that pay by the animal day or by, by head per day, uh, but most jobs pay by the acre. And that's primarily because most other vegetation management techniques, whether it's herbicide treatment or hand crews or mechanical treatment, also charge by the acre. And so when we're talking with landowners about doing this, we want to make sure that they can compare um, costs to other potential techniques. Our overhead costs are relatively fixed, uh, regardless of how big or small the operation is. And so in general, we want to be able to move across those landscapes as quickly as possible. Um, but we also, from a logistical standpoint, need to kind of know how long that job will last to have some ability to predict when we're going to need to move on to the next job. And so there's some things that we can do to start training our eye and, and improving our ability um, to do this kind of estimation. In terms of, of range science, um, if you've taken any range classes, uh, estimating our graze period is essentially estimating the carrying capacity of a particular piece of land. Um, and we'll talk about how, how that relates to the science piece of it here. So our basic math, and, and I'm sorry for doing math for you in the late afternoon, early evening. I know my eyes start to cross when I see numbers this late in the day. But a cow or a goat or a sheep that is not lactating, that's not nursing her young, will need to consume about 2.5 to 2.7 percent of her body weight on a dry matter basis per day. So we'll talk about what that looks like. Here in the Sierra foothills, um, in a normal year, we'll grow somewhere between three and 4,000 pounds of forage um, per, per acre. Let's see, I'm gonna check the chat box here. If I can find it. Okay, so you've been charging by the day or by the project for 15 years. Um, Sue, where are you operating? Are you in California? Washington, okay. Interesting. Most of the folks um, here in California 
have now gone to a per acre charge. Um, I'm aware in this last year of, of one contract that was let on a per head per day basis. So interesting that different, different places have different, uh, different techniques for doing that. Thank you for the question. So here in California, um, you know, if we're growing somewhere between three and 4,000 pounds of vegetation um, per acre in a, in a normal year, we also know that we're going to need to leave some vegetation on the soil to protect um, from soil erosion and, and provide a, a microclimate for seed germination once it starts to rain again. So if we look at, at the species here, um, I've got to move out of here. A thousand pound cow, which is probably lighter than the average cow um, in most of the West right now, but a, a, a thousand pound cow will need about 25 pounds of vegetation on a dry matter basis per day. Um, so she's going to consume um, somewhere between 750 and 800 pounds per month. Um, of, of, in dry matter. 150 pound U is going to need about um, three and three quarters pounds of, of forage a day and a hundred pound doe goat will consume about two and a half pounds. So why do we go through all that math? One of the things that this helps us to do is to kind of figure out what our graze period per acre might be. So if we have 3,500 uh, 3, pounds of forage on an acre of grassland that we're trying to impact um, and we're trying to leave say about um, 600 pounds at the end of the graze period, our 10 cows are going to go through that acre in about 10 days. Our 50 ewes might take 13 days and depending on the vegetation our 50 does are going to take about 20 days. Any questions about that? Let's see here. We got another question up here. So I, I think, um, Sue, so in, in your point there that, that Washington is, is too diverse, I think we also use the per acre charge when we're grazing um, brushland or forest land. I think it's, it's kind of the, the standard practice here. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing it the other way. Um, and actually, there's probably some advantage to you as a grazer to getting paid by head by day as opposed to by acre just because you're not held to a, a particular um, rate of grazing through that, that kind of landscape. Um, but we do see that as kind of the standard even on our more diverse timberlands and brushlands here in, in California. All right. So there's some practical steps that we use um, in all kinds of settings to, to estimate our graze period. So one of the first things that we do is um, we measure all of our paddocks regularly. Even if it's an area that we know we've grazed in the past, we wanna know what size that paddock is. And there's some tools that you can use um, with your smartphone or with other mapping programs that make that pretty easy to do. We also record, write down um, our livestock inventory in every paddock. And by inventory, we write down the number, size, and, and class of an animal. So um, if it's um, lactating ewes, we'll write down the number, size, and how many ewes are actually producing milk uh, versus dry ewes that, that maybe aren't lactating. And then we can, if we want, do a formal estimate of, of how much forage is in that, that particular area. Um, and um, that sometimes um, can get a little bit confusing if you haven't had a lot of experience doing this. The range term is, is an animal unit month, and that's a, the amount of forage that a thousand pound cow and her calf would consume in one month. We can convert that to sheep or goats through a standard formula. Um, but it, it's, I find it to be a little bit um, confusing in that regard. I do what I call the sheep herder method. So I record the number and class of the animals and the, the days per acre. 
And that gives me a specific estimate of what my flock is consuming at that time. Um, and I think that's over time, we've now done that for about five years and it gives us a really good way to estimate what we're going into. Um, the kind of the final piece of this is that I will do that estimate before we go into a fresh field and, and validate my estimate. So it's a really good way to, to begin training your eye for how much vegetation is there. And really this works whether you're talking about grassland or um, shrubland or any type of, of um, targeted grazing situation. Um, it really helps you kind of train your eye for how long it's going to take your animals to go through that vegetation. And I should say we, we graze grassland as well as, as shrubland with our sheep um, and do this in all of those cases. So to give you some examples here of, of kind of what we do, um, so this is, um, this is a place that we graze both summer and then late fall through the early spring. Um, and you'll note that um, when those animals are um, moving through dry forage, that, that that's at our peak standing crop. So up there in that first row in the summertime, we are harvesting um, on average around 157 sheep days per acre. Um, and that's because it's at the maximum point of growth in our, in our annual grasslands. You'll also note um, that we move a lot more quickly when we've got um, ewes that are gestating or with lambs at their side. And um, the same number of sheep will go through a lot more acres of forage um, when they're trying to produce milk and, and nursing their young. Any questions about this one? And those of you that are doing this, I would, if you're not kind of tracking this on a regular basis, I'd really encourage you to think about um, starting to get in this habit. It's really helped us make our estimates more accurate in terms of, of how fast we're going to move through a particular piece of ground. And you'll note here that, that as I said, we're, we're moving, um, we're not grazing as much per day because of the volume of feed at the end of the growing season. So a couple of notes on monitoring for you to think about here. Photo monitoring, I think, is a really great tool to demonstrate your effectiveness. Um, I would imagine a lot of you are already doing this. We have started using a, a, an app that was developed at University of Nebraska called GrassSnap, and I'll show you some photos um, from that app. It's a really useful tool for making sure that you're going back to the exact same location so you can do before and after photos. Um, if you're not doing that, you know, at least turning on the location settings of your cell phone camera so you've got coordinates for those photos. We have started using this program called Field Margin to do our mapping, and I'll, I'll give you a picture here. One of the things that we really like about Field Margin is that um, it's available both on a smartphone and on a, a desktop or laptop computer and it allows multiple users. So if you've got several people working with you, um, they can all be networked through this, this particular app. And what it does is allow you to drive or to walk the paddock boundaries and come up with a real-time estimate of the acreage. Um, and so it's a, it's a very useful, um, easy to use tool to, to allow you to track a lot of this. Anybody else using other programs or or, um, or mapping systems to, to do this sort of thing. I'll throw them in the, in the chat box if you get a chance. Dan, we use one called OnX, so uh, capital yep. O, lowercase n, OnX Hunt, and yep. it, it does pretty well for us. Yeah, OnX is a good one too. Um, and it, I think the other advantage to OnX is that if you subscribe to it, it gives you landowner names. And so it's a way to build a database of new potential clients too. Um, but that's, that's definitely a good tool. Anybody else? So um, the other piece of this is, is really to track your grazing over time. So I talked about um, kind of what we write down. Um, 
but our vegetation quality will change over the course of the year. And I think it's important to kind of acknowledge that and to track how that changes consumption rates. Uh, this is the kind of photo that we can get from, uh, from GrassSnap. Um, so you can see it's got the GPS coordinates on there. Um, it's also got an aspect, so the direction that you're shooting in. Um, and it's a, a pretty useful tool to go back before and after, but also a useful tool to go back from one year to the next to see if there are long-term uh, impacts from, from management. So this is a, I believe this is a five day graze period here with about 25 sheep. And uh, you can see that they, they absolutely hammered the yellow star thistle. Um, but if you look back under these oaks, they, they didn't have as much impact here where we didn't have the invasive weeds. We'll move on and talk a little bit about goals, unless there's any questions about, about that now. Dan, I think I could stand to learn a little bit more about um, vegetation quality um, over the life, you know, over the seasons. Is there some, I attended a rangelands webinar with you and there were words used like translucent and this and that, where you guys really understood what the weather effects were having on your, on your grasses and such. And those were new words to me. So as things go through a season of, of, as forage goes through, is there a resource I could use to kind of learn what vegetation quality is supposed to look like and what those words should be, you know, how do you use them? What does it mean? What does translucent mean as an example? Absolutely. absolutely. And, and um, translucent is not a, a term that I'm necessarily familiar with, but certainly you may have heard the transhumance term. That may be what, what we're talking about, where we follow the green forage. It could be it. It was all still new to me, and I realized yeah. I didn't understand what I was looking at, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll give you kind of a brief overview, and that's certainly something we can spend some more time talking about at the end. Um, when, when forage is growing rapidly, and, and I'm talking here about annual grasses or broadleaf plants, that are growing rapidly in the spring. Um, they tend to have higher levels of protein and higher levels of energy than they do um, when they're, they're going into reproduction, when they're flowering, or when with our annual, annual plants when they're actually dying. Um, and so we look at our forage quality as a, is really a measure of the protein content of the forage, the energy content of the forage, and then we can also look at some of the secondary compounds that may influence how palatable that forage is to an animal. So when we're talking about brush, um, for example, a um, lot of our brush species here in the Sierra foothills and, and even in the, in the high country and in the sagebrush steppe over on the east side will be high in tannic acid. And so that's gonna influence its palatability, its flavor um, for livestock and terms of their desire to, to graze it. Let me see here, we've got some questions here. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about nutrition here in, in just a second, um, but we'll, we'll uh, let me look at these questions. So we've got a question here about um, Calaveras County goat herd that had adult animals and babies grazing, but there was no herder or fencing. Um, there probably was somebody that you didn't see. Um, sometimes I've come upon sheep outfits in the, in the desert where I didn't see anybody out there readily apparent. Um, but the person may have been, been taking a break, um, back at, at camp. Um, in terms of targeted grazing, there are a variety of approaches that people use to make sure that we stay in the targeted area. And so in very large scale, kind of extensive operations, um, there will be a herder and typically herding dogs with those animals. They may not be fenced, um, but they're grazing to a certain specification within that area. In a lot of cases, we're using temporary electric fence to contain animals um, and, and also human presence. There's, there's the need to have both. Um, but but typically there would be somebody out there um, 
with them. It just may have been that they were, they were out on a break at some point. Second question we have in grazing sheep and goats together. Um, is it typical that they will graze grass almost down dessert to, to dirt before they will make impact on the brush? Not in my experience. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about grazing behavior here in just a second um, and grazing preferences, but that has not been my experience. Uh, BLM, no active grazing in the area. That sounds like maybe it was a trespass, um, which, which can happen as well, um, but probably not in a targeted grazing situation where there's a contractual obligation for the animals to be in a particular place. So the question was about whether they could, you know, breed and get, get loose in the wild. No, not, not, not in, in great numbers. No, I, I'm not aware of any, any feral sheep or goat flocks, um, primarily because we've got plenty of predators. So it would not, it would not be likely that they would be reproducing on their own. So we'll talk a little bit about landowner and, and uh, land manager goals here. Um, unless we've got some other question here. Yeah, that's a good point. Few, uh, we'll talk kind of about the season of use um, in terms of whether there's, there's intact um, rams or bucks with the flock in terms of a targeted grazing setting. Good point. So the landowner or land manager goals may include things like fuel load reduction or weed management, um, restoration. Uh, some landowners or managers are, are wanting to maintain aesthetic values. There are a fair number of folks here in California that are trying to avoid the use of herbicides. Um, we see a lot of targeted grazing in areas that may be too steep or inaccessible for equipment. Um, but there may be other goals as well. I, I had a, a contract here in Auburn where one of the goals for the community was entertainment. They would schedule dinner parties on the week that my goats were going to be in their backyards. Um, so, you know, it, it, there are a variety of goals that, that folks bring to this. I think from a producer goal, and those of you who are doing this kind of work, you know, add to this list. Um, income is certainly a, a goal for the folks doing this kind of work. Enterprise diversification, but also animal well-being. I don't think anybody that's in the business of using livestock for grazing um, is, is doing it because they don't like being with animals, and I think that's a, a big goal. Some more than others have a goal of reproductive efficiency, of, of really optimizing the number of offspring that they're producing each year. Um, and there may be some trade-offs there. Um, they may have the goal of, of making their labor effective and efficient, particularly if they're hiring labor um, and, and keeping that labor productive over the course of the year. Are there other goals that people have that, that are currently doing this business? Anything that I, I missed here? I think one of the challenges is really communicating um, goals between targeted grazers and landowners or land managers. So certainly there's some short-term goals in, in terms of dealing with this year's fuel load, for example. But maybe there's also some longer-term goals. Maybe one of our goals is to, to make our, our landscape more fire, fire resilient and resistant by removing yellow star thistle, which is a multi-year um, effort. Um, I think looking at multiple year versus single year entries, community safety. Thanks, Olivia. Good point. Multi-year projects um, have some real advantages over a single year project, and, and we'll talk about that in terms of economics. But I also think it's important to manage expectations. Um, you know, it's important for those of us with livestock to explain what the project will look like when it's done. Um, if the, the landowner expectations are bare dirt or um, a kind of a manicured lawn look, that may be not what we're able to do with livestock. And so being realistic about what, what it's going to look like when we're done. 
is an important aspect of that. We'll get into some of these practical considerations now, which I think are, are gonna answer some of the nutrition and grazing behavior questions. So if we think about it from a producer standpoint, we're really thinking about the nutrition that the animals need, um, their ability to reproduce, their own welfare, and then the logistics of putting all of those pieces together. So from a nu nutritional standpoint, the ideal time for fuel reduction, at least here in the foothills, is typically when our grasses are declining in their nutritional value. So the grass that grows um, in this picture here, this is, um, I believe, in, in uh, late December. Um, that green grass that's growing under last year's dry grass is high in protein and, and high in energy. But it's going to keep growing until we lose soil moisture. And so if we're trying to, to reduce the fire danger in that landscape, we're going to want to graze probably in May or June when it's not going to regrow. And at that point, it has far less protein in it, has less energy in it, and is less digestible for the livestock. So there's this trade-off between the ideal timing for the, the, the vegetation we're targeting and the needs of the animals. The other piece of this is that our nutritional demands change over time. So if we're just trying to maintain a ewe that's not producing milk or a cow that's not producing milk, her nutritional needs are far less than if we're trying to grow a lamb or trying to grow a steer, or if those animals are giving birth and nursing their young. Uh, their energy and, and protein needs are almost double at reproduction and lactation than they are at maintenance. And so timing our production system to kind of match those, those nutritional demands is important. There's also some issues with toxicity, particularly when we're talking about targeted grazing. We can have toxic plants, and if our, our target is to take vegetation down to really control the fuel load, um, a plant that an animal maybe wouldn't graze otherwise all of a sudden becomes, um, becomes of interest to the animal and we can have some toxicity issues there. We find when we're grazing near homeowners associations or, or close to town um, that the helpful public can cause problems. Um, gosh, it'd be great if you could throw all your yard clippings to the sheep since I don't know what's in them. Um, and we do see that on occasion where people will throw yard waste or, or other things without understanding that there may be some toxic um, materials in there. And then we also can have potentially some environmental toxins. Um, I know some folks that grazed a, a reclaimed landfill several years ago had some problems with, uh, with rodenticides in the landfill that had been left out inadvertently and actually lost, uh, lost livestock to the rodenticides. So those are all things that we wanna look at when we're, we're thinking about bidding a particular job. Now we can manage through some of that, um, those challenges in palatability. A ruminant animal, a cow or a sheep or goat is gonna require about seven or 8% protein in her diet in order to maintain um, the, the microflora in her digestive system. So if we're able to feed those bugs, those bacteria in the rumen, we're gonna increase the amount of dry forage that those animals are able to, to digest. And we'll increase actually the rate of passage of that dry forage through their digestive system. So if our annual grasses right now in October here in, in the foothills are, are four or 5% protein, we can put extra protein out um, in the form of in a variety of forms to get those animals to continue to eat the dry forage. But keep in mind that that also has a labor cost and has a, a cost of purchase that, that is associated with it. We can use supplemental protein to provide focused animal impact. Um, you know, if we're using um, hay, for example, as our supplemental protein, um, we can feed that hay where we want to have a, a additional impact from trampling and, and close grazing. Reproduction is related to nutrition. 
So targeted grazers and, and those of you on the, on the webinar tonight may have different experiences. But when we were targeted grazing, our conception rates were lower um, because we were, we were nutritionally stressing our animals to some extent to get them to manage the vegetation we were targeting. And so we had, had lower conception rates and lower lambing rates, which we tried to make up for by getting paid to graze. One of the factors here is the length of gestation versus the length of time targeted grazing. And so in this regard, cattle or sheep, or cattle, sheep or goats, um, which are pregnant for about 150 days, offer a lot more flexibility than cattle. Cattle are pregnant for um, over nine months. And so um, there's very little time when they're not either pregnant with next year's calf and or nursing this year's calf that, that we can um, push them a little bit more nutritionally. I think part of the consideration for producers is what drives your production calendar. If you're focused on making animals available for grazing, um, you may have a different production calendar than if you're trying to maximize the number of lambs or kids or calves that you're producing. And we'll talk about that in, in a little more detail. The other factor here is whether or not you want to have animals giving birth in public. Um, lambing is absolutely my favorite time of year, but when you're lambing or kidding um, next to a subdivision, you can uh, pretty well expect that every time a ewe goes into labor, somebody's going to call your, your cell phone and let you know that that's happening. And so there, there may be some reasons not to do that in public as well. We'll talk a little bit about animal welfare. Um, this could also be related to nutrition. Um, if we're dropping in our, the animal's body condition, um, shade and shelter are, are part of, of what we look at in animal welfare. Uh, part of this is explaining to the public that, that trees are shade and shelter, um, that we don't need constructed shade or, or barns um, for the animals to go into necessarily. I think there are some challenges with managing animal health issues in a public setting. Um, one of the questions that we get a lot with sheep here um, is, is related to foot health and there are some bacterial diseases that sheep and goats are subject to that can cause limping and, and lameness. Um, and so managing that in a public setting can be challenging. Predator protection is, is an issue even in projects that are close to cities. Um, Probably one of the biggest issues that we have in the foothills close to town is, is free roaming dogs, and that can be a real problem. And so how are we gonna protect the animals, whether it's electric fence or, or livestock protection animals or, or some other technique, it becomes a question. We're always cognizant of, of fire, especially this time of year, but other kinds of natural disasters that could impact our ability to get to our livestock. Um, and that takes some careful planning as well. There is a place for both wool sheep and hair sheep. And hair sheep, for those of you that aren't, aren't sheep producers, are, are sheep that naturally shed their wool. Um, wool sheep have to have the wool removed once a year, and so that becomes a logistical challenge in terms of, of uh, animal welfare. And then thinking about the right kind of animals for the situation, and we'll talk about this in just a second. Logistical concerns are access and terrain, how easy it is to get animals in and out and build fence. Um, can we get there with trucks or do we have to use smaller truck and trailer configurations? Many contracts require somebody to be on site 24 seven. Uh, most of the contracts here in Placer County are, are that way. Do you have all of the portable fencing and other portable equipment, including equipment to haul water to the stock? Um, are you going to have to shear and what does that look like in terms of, of, of logistics? Many operations will take sick or injured animals home or take them to um, smaller pens where their, their herders are camped just to be able to keep a closer eye on them. And then I think this livestock urban interface question is really interesting. We heard a lot, hear a lot about the wildland urban interface, but Anytime we've got large groups of livestock in close proximity to large groups of people, um, there can be some interesting challenges. We've had, had uh, people um, 
take fences down. We've had people vandalize our equipment. Um, all of those types of things can be an issue logistically as well. Any questions on that or any other observations that, that others have had? All right, so let's go through grazing behavior real quick. I think one of the things to keep in mind is that not all livestock are created equal. Livestock have different but overlapping forage preferences. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I think there's probably as much variation between individuals as there are between species. So our sheep, in part because of the way that we have managed them, um, will eat a variety of brush species. I've been around other sheep that, that don't know that brush is grazable. And so part of that is how we, we impact their behavior. Dr. Fred Provenza um, was a, a researcher at Utah State who has done a lot of work on understanding how to develop and maintain uh, and manage dietary preferences in livestock. And I've got a reference um, for you in the, at the end of the talk here. But the bottom line is that just like with humans, um, animals learn to eat from watching their mothers. And there actually is some evidence now um, that, that some of those grazing preferences are formed in utero by what the ewe is grazing or the doe is grazing while she's carrying her young. A good place to start is to match animals with the vegetation type. Um, as I said, our sheep don't read the books. They're browsers as well as grazers. But generally, cows prefer an 80-20 ratio of grass to, to broadleaf plants. Sheep are a little more varied in that they'll eat kind of a 50-50 diet. And then goats prefer roughly 20% grass to 80% broadleaf or brush. That's not to say that there aren't goats that will only eat grass or sheep that eat more brush or even cows that will eat brush. But that's kind of the, the place to start. Um, obviously, the animals have different impacts by species. So those heavier animals, cattle are going to, you're going to be able to do maybe more trampling and more manure deposition than you would with the small ruminants. And then we also want to look at the class of animal. So um, a dry cow or a dry ewe that's not lactating um, may have different impacts than feeder animals or stalker animals. Um, than females that have offspring. And then I think there's a real value sometimes in using um, castrated males just for grazing animals. Um, I know some producers here in California have used um, three and four year old goat weathers as a way to really impact heavy brush just because they're bigger animals and they don't have any nutritional stress associated with reproduction. So we try to really expose our lambs to, um, to a variety of forages. Um, you can see this lamb's already learning how to graze on Italian thistle, which is a good thing. We manage our preferences through supplemental feeding so we can provide protein or mineral um, to get animals into an area. Um, we can withhold mineral and then provide it again in different forms to get animals to try vegetation that maybe they haven't been exposed to in the past. Animals also have a spatial memory. Um, they remember the landscape just like we do. And I think this is part of what makes multi-year projects more effective. Animals remember uh, coming back into a landscape about where certain types of vegetation are growing. And then we can use water placement and supplement and salt placement to draw animals to specific locations or to have specific impacts in those areas. Couple of observations, check the chat. Couple of observations in our, with our sheep. Um, we have found that milk thistle, which is the real shiny um, broadleaf thistle that, that we see growing here in the foothills, um, is palatable at certain times of year. Um, we'll find that the sheep will go in that. If it's the only green thing in the environment, they'll go in and graze it heavily. Um, if other things are growing, they won't graze it quite as readily. Coyote brush is a, another species that we have quite a bit of here in the foothills that um, it's a native species but can create a, a fire hazard. Um, and our sheep, despite what the books say, absolutely love it. They'll, they'll graze it at any time of year. 
poison oak, which this picture shows, um, is a little more variable. And poison oak tends to have um, more tannic acid in it than some of the other breast species. And so at a, some point, our sheep will, will go off of poison oak and not graze it um, during parts of the year. I think there's also a boredom factor involved here. I think just like we get tired of the same thing day in and day out, um, even the most nutritious forage, if it's the only thing that those animals are getting, um, will create some boredom. Just about wrapped up here. I wanna show you a few before and after pictures and kind of the value of these, these grass snap photos. So here's the one that we saw earlier. Um, this is uh, July 18th, 2018. Five days later, um, we're able to show some pretty serious impact on the yellow star thistle. This is a stand of uh, Italian thistle in mid-July of 2018. And one day later, um, it's absolutely gone. That's, that's the same picture there. Here's a little ephemeral creek that uh, had a pretty good infestation of Italian thistle and yellow star thistle. Um, and this is a six day graze period um, in 2018 where we're able to really impact that, that ephemeral stream course. Lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about trade-offs. And I think this is important if you're thinking about this business, but it's also important if you're considering um, using this as a tool in, in lands that you're responsible for. So there is this overlap between livestock production and vegetation management. And I think the successful targeted grazing businesses are the ones that find greater overlap. And we do this by matching um, our production system, by matching our production calendar with, with the ability to graze particular vegetation types. This is a little bit confusing if you're not into livestock production, but I wanna compare um, fall and spring calving or fall and spring lambing um, systems. And if we think about when animals are available for targeted grazing, it really has to do with where we are in the production cycle. If you're in a fall lambing system, um, you can have animals available for targeted grazing without stressing them nutritionally for a good part of, of the, uh, the warm months. And that really tells us kind of when our optimal fuel reduction window might be. So if we go back here and look, um, fall calving cows or fall lambing ewes provide a little more flexibility in terms of, of that particular vegetation goal. Now there may be other vegetation goals that you're, you're thinking about, but this is an important piece of that. The trade-offs here, um, if we're in a vegetation management business, our revenue is generated by removing vegetation. We might have to stress the animals nutritionally to do that, but the calves or lambs or kids that we're producing are a byproduct. Our primary product is, is vegetation management. So the keys to our success in that case are covering as much ground as possible as quickly as we can. If we're in the livestock production business, our revenue is generated by weight gain and reproductive efficiency. In order to optimize that, we really have to focus on nutrition, particularly at breeding and during lactation and, and, and parturition. So the keys to our business here are producing as many lambs or kids or calves as we can and finishing them as heavy as we can. So two very different sets of goals that I, I think are important to keep also important to keep in mind that there are, if, if you're doing this as a business, and, and I hope that those of you that are doing this can weigh in on, on some of these points. In addition to knowing about animal husbandry and range management, um, you're gonna have to be versed in public relations to some extent. You're gonna have to deal with logistics. Um, one, one producer told me, one targeted grazer told me, I'm actually getting paid to know where my sheep are gonna be before they're at your property and where they're going when they're done. That's a, a huge logistical task. You have to have some knowledge of fuel and fire behavior to be able to, to articulate this um, to customers. You're marketing a service rather than an animal and that's a di very different approach I think for many of us. Um, contracting is a, an important consideration 
and then some understanding of botany and, and the stages of plant growth is, is an important skill to develop. Mm -hmm. Couple of takeaways. Um, as with conventional production model, models, targeted grazing operations do have to consider the relationships between nutrition, reproduction, animal welfare, and, and all of those logistical concerns. It's important to have an understanding of grazing behavior and, and preferences um, so that we can match the right class or type of livestock to meet a landowner's particular goals. There are trade-offs involved in focusing on vegetation management rather than reproduction or, or production-oriented goals. And it requires a different set of producer skills. So with that, um, I've got um, I've got some resources for you here. Um, if you're interested in doing some some additional reading, I'll leave these up. Um, the targeted grazing handbook is especially um, good if this is an area that you're interested in learning more about. Um, it's it's a little bit dated now, and there's an update coming out um, soon to this, but that really is a good resource. Um, if you're interested in um, in uh, Fred Provenza's work, that, that 2010 publication is really interesting as well. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I will send these resources out to everybody. Um, but are there, are there questions? Let me go through here. We've got a few questions in the, in the chat here. Um, fiddle neck. Um, can be toxic to, to some livestock at certain growth stages. Typically, it's not very palatable. It is more of a toxic, toxicity issue when it's in hay um, because then the animals can't, um, can't get it out of their diet. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Many fiddleneck species are native, and so we, we may not want to necessarily totally eliminate it in the landscape. Um, and we do see more, I've seen more fiddle neck in certain growing conditions. Um, is there any preferred animal for grazing manzanita, sagebrush, and bitterbrush? So manzanita is, um, is grazable, in a, at least in my experience, in a pretty short time window. Um, I've, I've had animals graze it in the wintertime. I'm curious as to whether other folks have had a whole lot of, of luck with manzanita. Sagebrush and bitterbrush um, are both grazable by sheep and goats. Um, cattle will also eat bitterbrush, in my experience. Um, there's actually some research being done now um, where we've discovered that some sheep have the bitterness gene, just like some humans can't taste bitter. Some sheep can't mm -hmm. taste bitter as well. And so I think there's some opportunities to look at the genetic relationship to some of those types of preferences on brush species in particular. Uh, question about clearing the perimeter areas where our electric fences are placed. We typically do not clear um, perimeter areas. I know that there are some targeted grazers that do that. We will run through with a four-wheeler um, or just by trampling the grass along our fence lines, but we typically don't mow or, or trim our fence lines um, with our electro net fencing. Um, we use low impedance fence energizers, which um, does not, it's a, it's a very short pulse of electricity through our fence. And so the fences do not build up any heat um, and it makes them fire safe in a, in a dry condition. Any other questions? I've got one more poll, unless there are, are other pressing questions and you're welcome to ask them um, in person or, or ask them um, in the chat box. Hey Dan, it's Corinne again, and I will just be an advocate for clearing fence lines. Uh, we do a targeted grazing business and a lot of the times we're in super dense forage where we have to put a clearance down so we can even put our nets down and for them to even be effective against predators. So there's always a place and a time for each one of those opportunities. Absolutely, Corin. And we, we graze in some very heavy forage, heavy, heavy conditions as well. We'll certainly clear brush, um, but what we have found in tall grasslands is that it's a, it's, we, can, we can make the fence effective without having to go through and cut 
cut fence lines. Um, there's some techniques to doing that, that that may be something to think about um, in terms of labor savings. And if you're getting paid to do it and add that to the cost of your of your operation, that's certainly a, a value. Let's see, we've got a question about um, rate charged um, per acre. So it varies tremendously by size of, of project, by the amount of vegetation involved, by the difficulty um, in fencing or moving animals in and out. Um, here in the foothills, kind of the going rate is between $350 and $500 an acre with a minimum charge. Um, you know, I've, I've talked to folks that, that won't show up for less than $3,000 um, just by the time they've got the, the logistical challenges of getting animals in and out. Um, there are parts of the Bay Area that are considerably higher um, per acre charges. And there are large scale projects um, for utility companies or um, for large landowners that are multi-year, multi-thousand acre projects that are more on the, on the tune of 50 to $100 an acre. So it really varies um, on a variety of factors. Uh, we'll talk about insurance coverage in the business section. Um, and we've got another question about how effective are grazing goats and sheep the year after mastication. I think actually in really heavy brush, livestock are a great maintenance tool. Um, but if it's old decadent brush, livestock are probably not capable of taking down those, those 10 foot stands of, of uh, buck brush or, or other brush species that we're worried about. But following mastication, they can be very, very effective at maintaining that work. Uh, our earliest projects were all urban, where no one had a clue what an acre was. You went per day, and that totally makes sense. Um, part of it's what kind of the, the market um, norms are, and, and uh, you know, I think that's, that's figuring out how to charge in a way that, that people are willing to, to, uh, to pay would be good. Luke um, had a question about specific ways that we educate potential customers in terms of what the end product might look at. I'm embarrassed to tell you, Luke, how many sheep pictures I have on my cell phone, um, but a picture really is worth a thousand words. And so we try to do a lot of before and after photographs because that's a really graphic way to show people what, it, what it's gonna look like. Um, and, and to really explain that particularly on dry forage here in the foothills, we're gonna have Apache appearance. It's not going to look like it's mowed. It's not going to look like we took it down to, to bare dirt. 